Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, good. Um, I am really happy to be here tonight. Um, I drove from the Columbia River Gorge this morning and flew down from Portland to Sacramento and drove up to Chico. And I always love watching the landscape shift from our acres and acres of forest and snow-capped mountains to your orchards of walnuts and almonds and your golden grasslands, although some of them are a bit charred <laughs> driving along the freeway. This beautiful, fragile earth that we share. There are several thank yous that I too want to start with. I'm able to be with you today because of a really generous grant from the Regional Arts and Culture Council out of Portland, and because of the kind invitation of the Friends of the Library. And I would particularly like to thank Cynthia Pustajowski, the branch manager here, and of course, um, the woman without whom this would not have been possible, Merle. Can we just give it up for Merle? And another one for just libraries all around the world. Thank you, libraries. Mom used to take us to the library in Idlewild, California, and we'd come home in the summer with library just uh, like treasure troves, garbage bag, not garbage bags, grocery bags full of <laughs> books that we would then read on the porch and each week go back for a new um, a new treasure. So I am very, very grateful for libraries. Um, and Merle, who we met in Idlewild, has been behind the scenes absolutely tireless in her promotion of this event. Um, she has done everything from helping to design the posters, to buying cookies, to hosting me in her home, and serving as an unpaid publicist to gather you all here tonight. So thank you, Merle. I met Merle a few years before this picture was taken. So that's my little sister Rose on top. That's me. That's my dad. This is T. Marcel, or as we would later learn, her name was Sherline, and that's my sister Meadow, and that is mom's shadow taking the picture. <laughs> um, so Duncan and Merle were building a house right next door to our little cabin in Idlewild, and that's where we met. And one of my earliest memories of childhood is sitting with Merle and eating apple slices on the day that my sister Rose was born. <laughs> And I, I had remembered the apple slices and the porch and the day of Rose's birth. And then it was when we were talking a few summers ago and you said, but I was with you and we were sitting on the porch together. And so I just loved that there was that delightful presence of Merle in one of those mm -hmm. earliest memories. Um, so we kept in touch with Duncan and Merle when we went off to Haiti and then we eventually came back. So when I was 15 and we had left the mission field for the last time, Merle sent me home with a stack of books. Jane Austen, Isabella Allende, all these books with sentences that just sang. And she took me seriously as a writer even then, which is a great gift to be taken seriously as a writer when you're still a teenager. So I feel really grateful that I'm here getting to celebrate this long, long, long journey. Because if we go back that far, there are some journals in this book that were written when I was 14 and 15, so I think if I've done the right math, that's about 27 years between <laughs> the starting of and the final completion of this book. So thank you for being there through that. Um, the other important people that I would like to acknowledge tonight is, and without whom this incarnation of the book would definitely not have been possible, is my parents who are here today. John and Flip Anderson, you guys can wave if you want. So this is an incredibly brave gift that they have given me to uh, give these family, complicated family stories to share in this way. And they gave me their journals to read and to use and to quote from and consented to innumerable interviews, conversations, follow-up emails, uh, editing sessions where we would together look at various versions of the manuscript over the years. So it's an incredibly vulnerable thing to let your family story be shared in this way. And I am hugely grateful for that courage and vulnerability. 
And also here tonight as a special guest of honor is my grandmother, Grandma Lois. Can you wave? <laughs> So Grandma Lois is, is also hugely important in the keeping of the artifacts that went into the writing of this book because we would send her things from Haiti and she would, we ended up with them stored in Roman meal bread bags <laughs> and giant Chiquita banana boxes that ended up in the shop hidden under tractor parts and loose bales of hay. And I always associate Roman meal bread with walking up the dike to your trailer and these really thin, warm slices of toast lathered with butter and that was a reward for going to Grandma's house. And then you run off and go jump on the trampoline. So thank you, Grandma, for saving all those relics and Dad guarding the relics. <laughs> so it's no small task to sort through the legacies of a missionary childhood and try to make sense of that jagged legacy of trying to do good in the world and learning the hard way, how difficult that can be. One of the reasons why I felt compelled to untangle my childhood in Haiti and write this book um, and invite you into that experience with us is because of two words that I learned in an anthropology class in college. And the two words are emic and etic. Does anyone already know what those words mean? Great. Okay, so this is my, um, my little high-tech visual right here. Because I learn words best when, they're, when I can see them. So this is emic, E-M-I-C. And I like to think of it as in the middle. There's a little M in the middle. And it's the perspective that comes from those within a social group, describing themselves. So the other, etic, is, I like to think of it as ET, come from afar to gaze with wonder and astonishment on this other culture that is unknown to them. So emic and etic two very different approaches that can be taken to gathering research in behavioral sciences or in anthropological research. Are you getting the story from someone within the group? Are you getting the story from someone without gazing from afar, trying to make sense of what they're seeing? So um, I'm going to start with, get my notes in order here, um, I'm going to start with a paragraph or two. Um, that is how I approached Haiti as a young child coming in from afar as this outside observer from that etic perspective. Um, and how quickly, you'll see, that got complicated for us. On cassette tapes mailed home to the grandparents, we recorded our amazement of these first weeks in Haiti. Giant hummingbirds whirred along the hibiscus hedges and glow bugs sparkled in the grass. When it rained, wide green banana leaves were held overhead instead of umbrellas. At six years old, I was starting to realize that anything could happen in this brightly colored country. Naked boys raced tin can toy cars down the middle of the streets and no one stopped them or made them put on clothes. Camion drivers blared carnival music horns and barreled down on unsuspecting bicyclists like an orchestra gone insane. Even the mud houses were the color of bubblegum ice cream. Haiti, it seemed to me, was a cacophony of joy. Flagging down a crowded tap-tap to visit the open-air market in Capetian was an adventure in itself. Mom was careful not to let her hair touch the scuzzy, painted-on curtains of the improvised bus, two benches wedged into the back of a sagging pickup, Baskets jammed against knees, a chicken or a goat dangling upside down from the roof. Market women heaved Meadow and me onto their knees with powerful arms, and I'd burrow against the damp body heat, jostled by the rhythm of the worn-out shocks and the thumping stereo. When we tapped the side of the tap-tap to clamber out, we lifted our sandals to avoid the gray-green refuse that floated down the gutters to the sea. Sweet potatoes, grapefruit, and pineapples were stacked like jewels on squares of plastic. Barefoot children reached for Rosie's blonde curls. Meadow and I got more wary attention. Red hair, we'd been told, meant kwashiorkor, protein deficiency, an emblem of shame in Haiti. The market women insisted that my mother distribute her purchases equally. Ten oranges from one mashon, ten from the next vendor. 
Marmites of rice were sold just like the gospel parag parables, a good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over the sides of a clean scoured coffee can. If I tried to haggle over a scrap of lace or a mango, the market women laughed and egged me on. Their hips spread uncomfortably over low chairs, the smoke from their pipes drifting in a loose halo as they translated my butchered crayol into music. Everything in me wanted to holler a resounding yes to this new world and dive headfirst into the quicksilver flourishes of the language. But when I watched the grown-ups out of the corner of my eye, the ones who looked like me, the other missionaries, they all seemed to hesitate and hold back. On my mother's 29th birthday, we drove into Cape Haitian, but she was disillusioned when she tried to walk along the seafront in the Cape Haitian seawall. The reek of the clogged gutters was impossible to ignore, and faded plastic bobbed in the surf. Longing for serenity, she led me down the dirt road in front of the ag center on the back of the bony Saint Agricole donkey. Women squatted in front of charcoal fires, and boys called out across a cactus fence. They told us we should give them the donkey, plus the pants that my mother was wearing. I was confused and annoyed. My mother didn't know how to respond. The staggering inequity between their lives and ours demanded an explanation. And yet, poverty was more or less what we had expected to find. Conversations around the missionary dinner table made it seem obvious that Haiti was a country in need of our help. This was, after all, why we had come. As farm stock, we were unaccustomed to being treated like dignitaries. My parents knew how to plant their feet on the earth and work hard. They valued self-reliance and stubbornness. They looked up to no one, nor did they expect anyone to look up to them. And yet, there was an undeniable deference shown to us as missionaries. The Haitian pastors who visited the Ag Center from working class families came only as far as the gate, where they waited and did not enter without permission. Was there some unspoken rule we didn't know about? Were they afraid of the dogs? I couldn't imagine anyone being scared of the black Labradors that licked our ears and noses, so much more friendly than the farm dogs under Grandma Lois's porch. But the Haitians tapped and waited until someone emerged from the missionary domain. At first, it felt uncomfortable. Then it began to feel routine. We had become the blanc, the wealthy foreigners, even if, in our own country, all that we owned was an eight-foot-wide trailer and a cabin with a pit toilet. For even that small hoard, meager though it might be, so far outstripped the earnings of subsistence farmers, fishermen, pastors, and market women, that in truth we had been privileged all along, and we hadn't even realized it. To make matters even more complicated, we had servants for the first time in our lives. At the insistence of the outgoing missionaries, my parents paid a cook, Adeline, as well as a woman named Maomer, to wash the evening dishes, and my father supervised a staff of ag technicians and gardeners, but it wasn't the life that my parents had imagined servants of God to lead. Adeline, who spent hours stirring cornmeal mush in an aluminum pot over a charcoal stove, while her three-year-old son, Nospen, played beside her, never complained. Adeline's husband worked in the U.S. and sent back money, but he didn't have a green card and couldn't legally bring the rest of the family over to join him. It did not escape my mother's attention that while someone else cooked our dinner, her daughters leaned over her arm and narrated whimsical stories to inscribe in graceful calligraphy. Our job was to illustrate these and other fantasies. While Adeline hunched over a plastic tub in the yard to scrub our clothes into a sudsy lather, my mother had time to teach us to sew on a treadle sewing machine set up under the mango tree. We pumped furiously, our feet propped against the foot pedals, amazed as the round wheel spun and sang. With our mother's hands to guide it, the needle bobbed and pierced the clean-cut fabric, leaving ribbons of thread in its wake. When she stomped her foot down firmly to force the rocking pedal into submission, from under her fingers emerged a dress with a bright ruffled hem. 
Hearing about a local Baptist women's group that sewed clothes for the poor, my mother herded the three of us girls along to see if we could help. The Dame d'Orcas, as they called themselves, were already hard at work when we arrived. Thirty women hovered around two treadle sewing machines. Those with scissors knelt on the dirt courtyard to snip without patterns around the outline of finished dresses. The unpinned fabric was then handed to women at the sewing machines who turned over the finishing work to assistants on the periphery, needles flashing as, the, as they mended hand-me-down children's clothes and frayed pants. As soon as we arrived, the fluid movement eddied to a halt. Bustling, officious women swiped the chairs from the ladies at the sewing machine and lifted them over the heads of the others so we could sit down. My mother tried to refuse, but the leaders waved away her protestations. We were their guests. My mother submitted, uncomfortably queen-like, and perched on a woven grass chair. Meadow and I were lifted and plunked down beside her. The leaders nodded approval. The old pattern of colonialism, however distasteful, was a well-worn rut. Worse yet, our arrival signaled the beginning of a Bible study. A woman with a commanding voice broke into a dramatic opening prayer as lace handkerchiefs were adjusted atop tight braids. I waited until my mother wasn't looking, then slipped down to scrape at a trapped stone with my fingernails. Meadow followed suit, and before the prayer was finished, we were squabbling over who had commandeered whose territory. Rosie went after the chickens. They squawked noisily as she gave chase, fluttering irresistibly towards a steaming chaudier of rice and beans on a bed of hot coals. Motionless Haitian children watched our antics from a small square of fabric, presumably having been warned not to move. As soon as the Bible study ended, my mother whisked us away, stammering apologies. On the slow, sweaty walk home, she felt surprised at her sharp envy of the women in the dirt courtyard. She tried to explain it to the grandparents on the cassette tape. The Dame d'Orcas had one another, and they'd found ways to care for their community with the little resources that they had. Despite my mother's misgivings, she didn't try to give up trying to help. She donated money, bought fabric at the open air market, and brought along her auto harp when the Dame d'Orcas prayed and sang for the sick, the women seemed delighted that she wanted to join their group, but it was clear to my mother that they didn't need her. So, as you can see, it gets complicated fast. There we are, trying to do good, and falling into all these things that we didn't even know were there to be ruts to be slid into. So, arriving in Haiti as a six-year-old missionary's daughter, I knew only that edic perspective of an outsider come in trying to make sense of this new place. Um, and yet even with my oversimplified child's version of that, Haiti is this cacophony of joy, um, I felt the discord within me when we then returned home to our own country, the U.S., and tried to talk about what we had seen and experienced, and that dissonance between what we were learning to see, the complications that we were living, and how Haiti was viewed by yet another step removed by the people that were supporting us and the stories that they had heard. So this distinction um, between the emic and the etic doesn't just apply to Haiti. We'll get back to that, and it's very important to distinguish between how people within Haiti view themselves versus how Haiti is perceived by outsiders, but it also applies to the missionary experience. So I had heard two very different outsider interpretations of missionaries growing up, um, and one was the Sunday school version, where it's very holy and the missionaries are so amazing, and everything we do is blessed by God. People have our refrigerator pictures, like, we are it. And then there's another version, also an outsider perspective, where everything that the missionaries touch, they ruin. And it's a destructive, completely entwined with the colonial imperialist regime. And both of those stories felt incomplete to me as a missionary's daughter. They felt like the outsider's perspective. So in part, this book is an attempt to let you in to what it felt like to be there as a missionary's daughter, trying to make sense of the world that I inhabited, which is that in-between. So um, I'm going to read a little bit of that missionary's daughter 
coming home. Sometimes, all five of us took to the stage like the Von Trapp family to sing hymns in Creole, which the little old ladies loved. But to really wow the church audience, we'd grab the bony ankles of chickens that we'd brought along as props and flip them upside down, wings fluttering, until they stopped squawking and we could proceed into the sanctuary, the carpet tickling our toes, baskets on our head tipping precariously as we turned to face the delighted applause. In church circles, albeit not the wider world, being a missionary was almost as good as being a movie star. <laughs> My parents wrote endless thank yous for the crumpled $5 and $20 bills that filled the velvet donation bags at the end of each presentation, not to mention the more substantial pledges of $15 a month. But I began to feel like a jackrabbit caught in the glare of the spotlight. I squirmed away from the two soft hands of church ladies who patted our shoulders and assured us that they were praying. Our audience was too gullible, too easily charmed by our showmanship. Our stage act was a parody of the splendid cacophonous world that we had left behind. I couldn't begin to explain all the things that I missed about Haiti. The lizards that puffed green throats against the ceiling, the crack of thunder and the roar of rain on tin, snorkeling in bathtub warm beach water, the buzzing cicadas, tap taps bouncing over potholes with music blaring. But it seemed like the only stories our supporters wanted to hear were about how sad and poor everyone must be in Haiti and how much good we must have done bringing God's light into such a dark place. I gave up. They didn't get it. So, oops, lose my place. Even as, as a seven-year-old girl coming back from that first year's missionaries, I was bristling against that outsider view of Haiti. Um, as missionaries, I knew that we weren't holy. We were a mess. We shouted at each other sometimes, and we were selfish sometimes and generous at other moments. And we were trying in our limited but stubborn way to help, and it didn't always go well. I'm going to skip ahead now. There are plenty of examples here of, of projects gone awry. Um, but I'm going to skip ahead to a passage from the last year that we lived in Haiti when I was 15. Because by the time I was a teenager in Limbe, I was an admittedly resentful teenage missionary's daughter. And I was no longer even remotely interested in performing Creole hymns when we visited the homes of Haitian farmers, or standing on stage with my sisters at a church fundraising slideshow. I was tired of the spotlight. I was disgusted by the pedestal that we were placed on as missionaries. Unbeknownst to me at that time, at the same time that I was pushing back against these expectations, people in Haiti, others, not everyone, but there was many that were growing tired of the way that we as foreigners were seeming to always inhabit the spotlight. At the time of the earthquake in Haiti, which is jumping ahead a bit in time, there were 10,000 aid organizations registered in Haiti. 10,000 raising money for schools, hospitals, churches, reforestation and water projects, each with their own unique vision of how to improve Haiti, and each fundraising newsletter telling more or less the same story. Here are Haiti's problems. Here is how we are helping. Our good intentions were not, as we assumed, always universally appreciated. And that became very visible in the 1990s. The Duvalier dictatorship had ended, there had been a series of military coups, there was a lot of political upheaval, and then finally there was a democratic election cycle. And Jean Bertrand Aristide was the clear front runner, and it suddenly became apparent to us that our benevolence, as we had seen it, was also viewed from another angle as oppression. So the homes that we lived in, the vehicles that we drove, our salaries were all paid for by the stories we told about Haiti's poverty. And there were people that were tired of that story being endlessly repeated. So 
The structures that we had set up did not often allow for Haitian entrepreneurs <coughs> and leaders to rise to the levels of their giftedness. On the missionary hospital, almost every position of authority was held by foreigners. And that old deference that we had been given was starting to erode in certain circles. So um, it became painfully apparent, at, and it peaked at a moment when we were told that the missionary hospital was going to be burned to the ground. So all the women and children were evacuated. Um, so I'm going to pick up and read a little bit there. Because it felt like, and I remember this distinctly, like the ground was falling out from beneath us. Here was this moment where the narrative that we told about how we were offering hope to Haiti was being pulled apart, falling out from beneath us. The other kids were already milling around the front porch of the Hodges house as we hugged our bags and waited for further instructions. The rumors were growing. Somebody had seen the body of a headless man being carried through the streets. The phone lines had been cut in the Baptist headquarters in Capetian. Pastor Tomas had received death threats if he showed up to preach at the Limde Baptist Church on Sunday. Steve and Nancy James stood next to each other, their calm interrupted by an unspoken question. Will you still be here tomorrow? Asia and Andrew clung to their father, four arms circling his waist, not wanting to let him go. The high school boys had no intention of missing the fight if there was to be one. Ryan's jaw was set. His adopted sister, Angelina, beat her fists and howled, furious that her mother and brother were not coming with her. Susan had also refused to leave the hospital, although she too was sending her children away. Cars filled unevenly and bags were shoved onto laps as mothers made sure they knew where, exactly where their children were. Mano leaned against Caso's car, the keys clinking in his hands. He had driven over to help talk us through any threats we might encounter along the way. He was risking his life for hours. I felt ashamed that I had misjudged him. We were the last to leave. Mano took the wheel next to our fearless youth group leader. My two sisters and I squeezed into the back. I wondered briefly if we should have grabbed mom's camera, but it was too late now. The car thumping down the rutted dirt road past neighbors who leaned back against their porches to watch us go. My father had already told us some of the accusations being made about the missionaries. We were greedy foreigners who only wanted to steal from Haiti. We had made ourselves rich by their suffering. The attack on the hospital never came. Pastor Tomas preached on Sunday to an overflowing crowd at the Limbe Baptist Church. The threats evaporated with as little warning as they had arrived. Perhaps the prayers had worked their magic. Or, as my father wanted to believe, the silent majority in Limbe had decided that enough was enough. When we finally returned to the compound after two nights away, it felt like waking from a dream. We did not know how to speak of the evacuation, even amongst ourselves. We had been baptized into the same fear as our neighbors, the ones who had no option to leave. And there was something in those murky depths that we were eager to forget. Whatever fear or grief we felt, we buried deep. I berated myself for having ever been so foolish as to think we were really in danger. Despite our assumptions, it seemed increasingly clear that the story did not really revolve around us. We had leaped so quickly into that old, tired role, the beleaguered whites surrounded by a rioting black mob. But we had misread the cues. Our need to see ourselves as benefactors, without whom the Haitians, impoverished and hopeless, were doomed to live in darkness, was outdated at best. Why would Haitian visionaries and entrepreneurs settle for menial entry-level jobs in a missionary hierarchy that would never let them rise to the level of their giftedness? We too were responsible for this unraveling. Always it was the same. We placed ourselves like heroes at the center of the story, as if it was our destiny to save Haiti. 
What we couldn't seem to understand was that Haiti needed our respect, not another failed rescue mission. Trying to make sense of this complicated heritage as a missionary's daughter is a long, slow process full of difficult stories that have been hard to face. But getting to know Haiti as an adult has been a gift. I returned to Haiti in the spring of 2010 as a reporter for the radio show This American Life to report on earthquake recovery efforts. And I learned how many people had taken in refugees from the earthquake, how many people had donated one of the only pairs of shoes they owned to people that had lost everything. Ingenuity and resourcefulness were everywhere I looked. Growing up on the missionary compound, I had been trained to see only the poverty and loss. But looking at Haiti from the Attic perspective, as an outsider, I had failed to see the inherent dignity and determination of ordinary people. And I was fortunate during the writing of this book in the very early stages, along with all the documents pulled out of the garage, to spend time with a Haitian American professor of Francophone literature in Portland, Cecile Asilien. She's now the director of Haitian studies in Kansas, which is where I'm going at the end of next week. And we set up an independent study, and I would show up in her office with a list of ignorant questions, and she would give me full permission to ask anything I liked. And she gave me these very complicated, beautiful, nuanced answers. In fact, she would often say when I asked my question, so this is something that I heard growing up on the missionary compound. She'd say, oh, let me complicate that for you. <laughs> it was so tender. <laughs> and she sent me home with stacks of books by Haitian authors. And I have a list in the back if you'd like a truly emic perspective of Haiti. Um, and I feel like what she offered me was a way of keeping my heart open to hear the hard and make it complicated. Um, there's a beautiful TED talk by a Nigerian novelist, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. It's called The Danger of a Single Story. And maybe you've already seen it. It's wonderful. If you haven't, I do recommend it. She talks in it about how misleading it is to assume that a single story can represent the whole truth. And so to fully understand or get as close to an understanding as we can, we need many stories. Um, oversimplified narratives reinforce stereotypes and reduce our ability to see the world in all its complexity. They don't help us keep our hearts open. So when I took my kids with me to visit Haiti for the first time uh, a couple years ago, they were eight and 10 years old, and I wanted them to be of an age where they didn't need language to make friends, and sure enough, they didn't. But we also talked before we went about how we didn't want to approach Haiti. We didn't want to just come in from that edict perspective as outsiders trying to make sense of it and say, oh, what is it that we have to fix in Haiti? So I actually had them watch a very funny uh, Saturday Night Live sketch, and it's very snarky and very wonderful about raising water for an impoverished village in Africa, and all the people in the background are commenting on the fundraiser behind his back, and it's, it's delightful. <laughs> and when we turned it off and I said, okay, let's pretend, boys, that somebody's coming into where we live and looking around and going, oh, wow, my life is so much better than yours. Here, let me help you. Like, how would that feel? terrible. It's a really icky feeling. So that's not going to be our posture as we approach this place. Let's go and ask what people love about where they live, what they are proud of about their community. And so that was our posture as we entered it. Um, and it wasn't a hard assignment because if you approach Haiti and try to hear that emic perspective, Haiti is an extraordinary country. Haiti for all that it has endured, has people that keep picking themselves up over and over again. After 300 years of colonization, which included genocide, widespread deforestation, the horrors of slavery, Haiti was nevertheless the first country, the only nation in the history of the world to throw off slavery and declare that all people have the right to be free, 60 years before we did in this country, for which the US cut off all trade relations with Haiti for 60 years. 
And the only way that Haiti was able to reestablish economic ties with its former colonizer, France, was to pay France reparations for having stolen themselves out of slavery. It's just mind-bending. So, there was so much that I didn't understand about Haiti's history growing up on the missionary compound, which is why I try to thread its history through everywhere I could in this book because history gives us an understanding of how we ar have arrived at where we are. Um, and it's not easy to put ourselves in the position of hearing the hard stories about how we might be perceived as an outsider, especially if it differs from how we see ourselves. But I do want to, to leave you with that invitation. So I'm gonna read a passage so Mano, that drove over to help us um, when we evacuated, I met him again 20 years later uh, when I was doing that reporting for This American Life, and he'd become a doctor, and he was driving down to the earthquake to get people and bring them back to the hospital. As we descended into the arid rain shadow of the Artibonite, Dr. Mano turned to the subject that we had both been avoiding. So I hadn't been very nice to him. He had been our language tutor briefly until I talked dad out of it because I didn't want to ruin my French accent. Yes. Um, here's something I don't understand. He put forth testily, lifting one hand from the steering wheel. In other places, you see missionary kids playing with the nationals, but here they create this separate space for themselves. I know missionary kids who separate themselves so completely they don't even speak the language. I shifted uncomfortably. The missionaries have their own school, their own church. Sometimes I think, why do you come to work here? You come to help the people and you love them so much you won't interact with them. He shook his head, his laugh bitter. It's funny, they love Haiti so much, but they hate us. I winced at his words. His anger, though it stung, needed to be heard. Too often, the stories we told ourselves as missionaries, aid workers, philanthropists, journalists, were the small but significant ways that we had helped a country in need, failing to understand that pity is corrosive. When you face an enemy who is trying to destroy you, if you laugh, you make him feel bad, Mano said. Who's the enemy now, I asked the earthquake. We have to show the earthquake that it did not succeed in destroying us. So this is heavy. <laughs> and there were many moments of writing this book, facing my own complicity, the ways that I had inadvertently hurt others that just felt heavy and sad. And I would feel the shame welling up in me. And in the long interwoven story of church and colonization, there is a lot to grapple with. Um, and to be honest, one of the tricks I learned as a kid on a missionary compound is the trick of minimization, which is that if I felt anything that hurt my feelings, um, that felt sad, I learned to push it down because there were so much, so many more larger losses surrounding us on every side. So how could I complain when something was so much bigger all around me? But it's not a very healthy way of going through the world, stuffing it all down. And what I'm learning now, this stage of my life, is that loss is the great human universal. We all get it in some form or another. It comes to all of us. And loss is loss. I have this dear friend in her 70s who says, look, you can drown in six inches of water or in six feet of water. Um, so the question is, what do we do with the grief? What do we do with the shame? Do we stuff it down? Do we turn it against ourselves? Do we turn it against others? Is there a way to transform grief, transform loss, transform shame into something greater than itself? To embrace it, to make it our friend, to let it teach us. And so I want to extend that invitation to you because that is the project that I've been on in the writing of this is to, there's a great line from the poet Rilke that um, you are to be bridegroom and the bride running towards you is your own shame. It's so stunning, that line. So here we all are in this shared moment in our history where that conversation about our own history in this country 
is awkward and hard to tell. There is a sign, right, and we enter about Indigenous Peoples Day on Monday, rather than the Columbus Day we used to celebrate. Here we are being asked to contend with a history that includes genocide, stolen land, slavery, deep losses. How do we hold those stories? It's so much simpler to tell a story from one, one perspective only. Missionaries are either marauders or saints. Haiti is either noble or savage. America is either great or it's a mockery of itself. It's much harder to tell stories where we are both and rather than either or. So I feel like that's our invitation in this moment culturally. If, um, like myself, you have ever been in situations where people assumed the best of you and gave you opportunities that weren't given to others, what does it mean to hold that? I wanted at 15 to be one of the good ones. I want it still. But I don't think there are any good ones. I think there's just us, flawed and fumbling, trying to do good in the world, making a mess of it most of the time. But we're in it together. So here we are. If we can be honest with our failings and be generous with each other's failings and move forward, I think we have a lot of hope together. Um, so when I went back to Haiti the year before last with my husband and boys, we got to spend some time with this young man named Elio, who was in his 20s, and he'd just come back from a semester abroad in the US, and he was coming back for the first time to his own community. And he'd been going around talking with people in, in schools, and he had this illustration, and I just love it. He would take a coin, and he would hold it up right in front of his eye, and he'd say, these are the problems of Haiti. And if you hold them right here, you can't see anything but the problems. But if you hold it out here, you can see the problem still, it's still there. But you can also see all the connections, all the possibilities around it. And so it was, it was lovely to hike with him up to this hill in the dusk and kids flying kites and the sunset streaming in the clouds and illuminating the mangoes and the rice paddies. And we walked down in the dark, most people that we passed knew Elio by name. Everybody called out and said good evening to us. And it was just that feeling of here we are surrounded by a community. There are many connections. And that is a richness, that is a wealth that we have a lot to learn from. So I'm going to close with one last passage and then open up for any questions you might have. For several years after the earthquake, I returned to Haiti every spring. As a child, I believed that we missionaries had been sent because we had something to give. But Haiti has survived the unspeakable again and again and stood its ground. Aitsi has learned through grief how to endure. And it was in this extraordinary country, which we so naively tried to save, that I first glimpsed what it meant to be fully alive. If you have come to help me, writes indigenous Australian artist and activist Lilla Watson, then you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up in mine, then let us work together. In Aitsi, after five centuries of plunder, little remains of the rainforest that Columbus once described as immeasurably lush and green. And yet, even if the meager biodiversity that remains represents only a shadow of the Earth's former glory, it is still worth protecting. We are more aware than we used to be of our fragility. We too are learning the hard way about drought, fire, floods, earthquakes, hurricanes. If we do not rein in our appetite for consumption, we will lose landscapes and creatures that we can never replace. As a recovering missionary's daughter, it feels like something of a consolation to realize that the part I have to play in protecting this beloved earth is laughably small. It is not mine alone to save, but it matters that we care. Love might only be a faltering song, broken music, but I can still add my voice. I repeated a benediction under my breath, let it be enough. So at the risk, Grandma Lois, of being political. 
I want to confess that right now I cannot stop thinking about the announcement earlier this week that we have an estimated 12 years to change our course on climate change and drastically reduce our emissions if we're going to survive this. We are facing brutal hurricanes, devastating fires like the ones that you were surrounded by earlier this year, like the one that evacuated my family from our home last year in the Columbia River Gorge and having flown and driven all by myself in a car today for hours, I know that I'm complicit in this. And that's it. That's the weight of it. We all are. Um, how do we care for this beloved place and seek out its good? It's the question I carry in my bones. But we are all in this together. So the prayer I keep praying, finding myself praying these days is, Dear Earth, I love you. Please teach us how to listen to you. Thank you. Do you have any questions you would like to ask? Yes. Well, I think it was in the 60s they came up with the phrase, the ugly American. Hmm. And I don't know which country that was targeted from, but it was like, I guess it was like the Americans who went to Europe or anywhere in the world and they, they would laugh in people's faces and say, oh, they can't speak English. When do you think we became so grotesque and obnoxious? Well, I think we are at moments grotesque, but I think we're also at other moments beautiful and generous. I was on the East Coast for some readings just a few weeks ago, and it was right at the tail end of that hurricane. And so I was supposed to take a train up to um, DC from Raleigh, and the train was canceled because of flooding. So I ended up on a Greyhound bus with every seat taken. And there was all the jostling and agitation. And Greyhound is a fascinating place to realize <laughs> what, um, who is not being served by you know, the glossy magazines and that representation of the life we're all aspiring to. And then you ride a Greyhound bus and you go, oh, here's people that are being left out of that version of the dream. And on that bus ride, there was plenty of behavior that could be described as grotesque. And then there was this other that was just tender and beautiful. And there was the woman in the front seat right in front of me that was next to a blind man. And she was leaning over, asking him where he needed to get to. And she was complimenting the bus driver as she pulled in. And, and the bus driver was at one moment threatening to throw anybody off if they asked a question and at the next moment helping this older woman with her bag onto the top shelf and and it felt like to me this reminder that we are as Walt Whitman says we contain multitudes at any moment we can be grotesque and I don't know how to answer the question better than that well if I can add a, a small um, re comment um, your grandmother reminded me, she said she loved the language of Swedish, but the whole family, when they came over, learned English. And, um, my parents also, that I mean, they had a strong identity to Italy and Sicily, and they spoke the language, and, but they had low self-esteem mm -hmm. because they felt like they weren't, you know, the, the ultimate ultra-American, you know, and they, and they had so much respect. For America, but I, I mean, I'm just talking about the LV American as in regards to the rest of the world, where we just were like considered ourselves experts just because we were American. That's that's what I mean. Yeah, that's unfortunate that we tend to assume that we know what we're talking about just because we're American. I think it started back in the 1800s or something. Yeah, I, I'm not a student of that particular thread of history to know, but it is it's a habit that we could do well to break this moment. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. You mentioned the Australian artist who described essentially a dialogue. Yes. Yeah. And appreciating your differentiation between emic and etic. Mm. So from the perspective of looking at the Haitians, you're etic. But yes. certainly you constitute a group right. of missionaries. Mm -hmm. And someone looking at you outside of that is etic. And you're asking this professor in Portland, 
and she's telling you, tell me what you thought and I'll tell you what really happened. So you're getting her perspective. Was there a dialogue? Did yes. she say to you, well, this is how I see missionaries. Tell me what your experience is in that perspective. Absolutely, and, and I'm going out to Kansas next week at her invitation because as a Haitian woman, she has many reasons to have a deep distrust of missionaries. And her invitation to come and, and speak is because this book helped her to understand missionaries in a different way and see the complexity of that experience. Um, because there is, I mean, there's plenty of moments of our, of our failing and our ugly moments in this, but there's also connection and discourse that's taking place that dad as a farmer has dear friends that are Haitian farmers and just that conversation and what that's led to. Um, there is there is much that is good in that for all that is can be harmful. Does that answer your question? Well I guess to put it simply, <clears throat> do you do you feel someone from outside your world can see and understand your perspective. That is why I wrote it, to help say this is what it feels like from within. So that the missionary story, here's another missionary story that is more complicated than the hagiography and more complicated than the aggressor. But my hope is that in reading this, you have both intention and that you have the both and story of this is what it feels like. I'll go again, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm, it's all right. um, I think the Seventh-day Adventists send their children out in the high school level from the boarding schools to poor countries in crisis. And I don't know this, but I'm guessing that they have a kind of a formula for dealing respectfully with the culture that they're, they're going to. And by sending high school children, I think that's fascinating. That they, you know, because the children probably don't have the type of ego that, you know, they go with it like a non-profit type. Have you ever looked into the that type of thing? No, I'd be interested to hear more about it. I mean, I can speak for myself as a seventh grader. I certainly had plenty of ego still. <laughs> you can still have a lot of arrogance as a kid going in assuming that you have something to give as a child. I mean, your parents had good intentions, the best of intentions, and it went awry despite your best intentions, not because of them. So, yeah. very honorable people. Mm -hmm. Very lovely. Yes? I just want to thank you again, Africa. Mm -hmm. and like I said to you personally, I'll say to the whole group, I pray over your book. It's giving me a lot to think about, a lot to pray over. And I do thank you. And for tonight as well. Thank you. Yes. In short, can you explain the role of a missionary? Well, I think that the missionaries that I am describing are a subset of missionaries, where the primary work was not evangelism, not converting anyone to a religion, but it was there to do agriculture, it was there to work in hospitals, it was to do these very pragmatic support roles alongside of the Haitian Baptist Church. So I know that there are other missionaries that the focus is less on that pragmatic work and on conversion, and I can't speak to that because that wasn't the world that I experienced growing up. Um, I know that in our newsletters, it was often phrased as offering hope to Haiti. And my editor at one point asked, how do you quantify if you've achieved that? <laughs> I thought, that is an excellent question, because it feels like there is this sending out to go and accomplish something that's very amorphous. So how do you know if you are doing it or not? Well, 
here we all are in a room together. And instead of this silence, we could have conversations with each other. So in Haiti, there's a phrase, mettez tête ensemble, you're putting your heads together. So if you want to, you know, turn to your neighbor and have a conversation about what we do over the next 12 years to help this planet and each other, I'm all for that conversation. <laughs> I have this book, um, which I have taken to every reading, and in it, I stole this from the writer Colin McCann, whom I adore, and he took his book around and said, I'm happy to sign your book, Oops. and if you want to sign my book, you're very welcome. So that's my invitation. I'm going to go sit at that table, and you're welcome to sign my book, and I'm happy to sign your book if you like. And if you don't have one, you want to take one home, there they are. Um, and unless there's any more questions, I think I'll call it good. Thank you. Yes. And I mean, I struggle with how do you raise the people who've been left behind mm -hmm. to the standard of living they'd like to have? Mm -hmm. Because that obviously yeah. increases our carbon footprint. Right. And so well, it's like, mm. how do we do both? Yeah. Well, I think there are ways of living together in community that don't have to improve, in, in, increase our carbon footprint. Like I think of my single house on five acres. Yeah, but I'm saying the people who are left behind, they want things. I mean, like yes. people who, who immigrate here to work. Yeah, they right. want they want the material things. Right. Which I can't I can't condemn. I mean, I have them. So I mean, it's they they don't come up here and say, well, I my goal is to have a composting toilet. <laughs> it's to have a big screen TV. Well, I mean, carbon footprints come in all forms because, like in Haiti, it's using charcoal to cook on. Can, that alone can be right. switched over to like these fuel efficient stoves that use twigs rather than right. and don't yeah. have low emissions and all that. So I don't think that having a life that feels less fragile necessarily has to mean a bigger carbon footprint. I think it, there are ways of Hopefully. Hopefully. My husband's a big believer in technology. So there you go. He's always he's always convinced that there is a way. Well, at least they'll mitigate it. Uh -huh. Thank you. Try to keep some optimism around. Thank you for coming. Yes. We're so excited about this. There's a group of us that go to Haiti every year. Oh. So we get a real love for Haiti. So we're yeah. about this. Yeah. We all got on board. And there's a whole group of family. Oh, thanks for coming. Good friend. Maybe she'll have a few words to tell you about. Oh, so, oh good. It's just a personal thing that we yeah. love. That Gladys, who is Haitian, that we go to, she goes, um, it's like getting malaria. Once you, once you get it in your bloodstream, you can't get rid of it. <laughs> so, so thank you so much for being here. Mm -hmm. What a treat. Mm -hmm.